open to the book of Galatians. Maybe by now it falls open to Galatians. We've been there quite some time. But uh, we are almost done. And actually, this morning's message is a two-point message, but uh, we're only going to take point one today, and we'll save point two. I guess it'll be two weeks from today, because we have Barry Rempel coming next week to, to speak to us. So then we will be done with Galatians. So let's join our hearts together and pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We are so grateful to you for the cross. We are grateful to you for the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice upon that cross. Lord, we so often forget, we so often lose sight of why we are so blessed. We we get caught up in enjoying the blessing, and we lose sight of the one who has blessed us. Lord, we also just thank you that we have the great privilege of calling you our Father. We have the great privilege of a hope for the future. But we oftentimes, again, forget about our responsibility here and now. Lord, we are to be your ambassadors. We are to be messengers of the cross. We are to be those who who minister in the name of Christ to lead others to salvation through his work on the cross. Lord, there are many things that press us for our time and for our attention and for our energy and for our finances, Lord. But... The cross is supreme to all of those things. Lord, help us, forgive us for when we lose sight of that. Forgive us for when we become, we become so caught up in our own personal struggles, our own personal challenges, that we lose sight of the cross. We lose sight of the support and the help that is available to us through the cross. We face many struggles and challenges without coming to you in prayer because we feel that we can handle it ourselves. We face many struggles and challenges without going to your word for guidance and counsel and instruction and correction because we think we can handle it ourselves. Lord, we, I think, face many unnecessary difficulties because we try to handle things ourselves. Lord, please forgive us for that. Help us to be devoted to you. Help us to spend regular time in your word, um, not just reading it, not just accumulating information so that we can impress our friends with how much we know about the Bible. But Lord, help us to internalize your word. Help us to, to learn it and know it and have it dwell in our hearts richly, that it will shape our words, that it will shape our actions, that it will shape our attitudes, that we may be more faithful in serving you. Lord, help us to to spend each day in prayer and in your word. We, We can't go without that necessary sustenance and survive and be faithful to you. Lord, help us to make that part of our regular day. And Lord, please give us opportunity to be your messengers, to minister to fellow believers, brothers and sisters, to minister to those who don't believe, um, that we may be able to fulfill the responsibility that you've given us. We don't have to be a pastor to, to share the gospel. You don't have to be an elder or a deacon or a Sunday school teacher, but... Um, Lord, we all know Christ as our Savior. If we do, we can be a testimony for him. Help us, Lord, to grow in that way. Help us to appreciate the value of the cross and all that you have done for us. Now, Lord, open our hearts to hear from your word, that we might be encouraged, that we might be exhorted, that we might respond in obedience as we examine our hearts in light of what you will say to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Galatians chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 16, but we're really focusing on the first half of that this morning. But, uh, you know, I come to the office during the week, and I, and I work, and I study, and I prepare, and plan, and various things, and then I take a break and go to lunch somewhere nearby. And this past week, one day, I went to Jimmy John's up here on Orchard and 10 Mile, 
I don't go there a lot because it's a little more expensive than other places are, but it's good, and so every once in a while I go there. And I ran into a guy at the Jimmy John's that I had seen at other places in the area, and I had never spoken to him before, but I recognized him when he came in. I think he recognized me, having seen me other local places as well. He's a big, big guy, big, strong guy, big white mustache and beard, and wears a sock hat, and... and um, he sat down at the booth right in front of me, but his, so his back was to me, and um, I decided, you know, I'm going to strike up a conversation. So I made a, just made a comment to him about something, and, and he turned around, and it's like, yeah, I've seen you, you know, I, I recognize you. And so we started talking, and man, can he talk. <laughs> he, he, he continued to, he, he told me so many things about himself and about his background and, uh, and about what he's doing now, and, and I could hardly get a word in to say anything to him or to even comment on what he had said. And so as the conversation goes on, he finally says to me, so what do you do? I says, I'm a plumber. What do you do? I said, well, I'm a, I'm a pastor. He says, oh, well, where, where are you a pastor? I said, right down the road here, Chinese Bible Church. And of course, he's like, really? Chinese Bible Church? You know, you don't look Chinese. And, you know, the usual, usual thing. And um, so I explained that I was the English pastor and had been there for quite some, here for quite some time. And, and uh, so then he says to me, well, you know, he says, uh, and he told me he was Jewish, not really actively practicing that, but he's Jewish. And uh, he says, you know, Christianity is Jewish. And I said, well, yeah, I know it has its roots there. And he says, and Jesus was Jewish. I said, that's right. That's right. And he says, he says, you know, the only difference, the only difference is that, you know, that thing about Jesus dying on the cross. And aside from that, everything else is the same. <laughs> and I thought to myself, wow, you know, but, but isn't that what makes all the difference? See, to him, he had reduced that as just an aside comment to accept that Jesus on the cross thing, right? It's all the same. And he was kind of trying to say that all religions are basically the same except for that Jesus on the cross thing. And he had kind of minimized that and set that aside so that he could be able to hold on to his claim of it's all, they're all the same. They're all basically the same. And as I said, I wish I could tell you that I was able to explain to him the gospel and that he converted and so on, but as I said, he talked so much I could hardly say anything. But I'm hoping to run into him again and be able to say a little bit more to him. So keep, them, keep that in your prayer. His name is, his name is Art... Silverman. So keep him in your, in your prayers, because I, I have a feeling I'll run into him again. But he was minimizing the cross, minimizing the cross of Christ. And, and again, that is what makes all the difference, is the cross, the one who, who died for us and who rose again victorious over, over sin and death. And, and you know, the, the cross has, has, I think, in some ways lost its significance to people in our day and age, right? We, we see people wearing jewelry, necklaces with a cross. We maybe see different artistic designs that might involve an image of a cross. Uh, maybe we, you know, we, church buildings used to have big crosses, very visible, obvious crosses. And, and today, with the seeker movement among us, Crosses have disappeared from many churches because they don't want to offend people and hoping they will come into the church and we don't scare them away by having a cross outside. So the, the idea of the cross, the image of the cross, has been minimized. It's been reduced. And um, I don't think we really, even as us, maybe not completely understand what the cross is sometimes. Right? We have a, you know, we have a cross here, which is good to have that as a reminder to us, but we need to know what it symbolizes, See, for us today, we've, I think we don't keep in the front of our minds what it symbolizes. In the first century, in the days of Christ and the apostles, the cross was an instrument of death. It was a tool used to execute people. It wasn't a nice, pretty gold little cross hanging on a chain. It wasn't some just artistic design, some ornate thing to, to add something to the room. It was an image of death. It was a symbol of execution. It was something that was offensive, that was vulgar, something that was shocking to people. 
And I think we've lost that shock and awe in response to the cross. To the Jews, to tell them that Jesus was their Messiah, and yet he was nailed to a cross, which was the most humiliating, most excruciating way to die. They, they, they couldn't fathom that. How could he possibly be the Messiah if he was nailed to a cross? That just doesn't fit. It doesn't make any sense. And a similar thing was going on in, with the Judaizers in Galatia. They were minimizing the significance of the cross. <laughs> they weren't openly denying it, but they were definitely minimizing it. We'll talk a little bit more about that this morning. They were adding the requirements of circumcision and keeping the law to what was necessary to be a Christian, to have faith in God. And they were reducing the true value of the cross in the process. So let's look at our passage here, Galatians 6. And uh, I'll read for you verses 11 uh, through 16. Please follow along. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Now, as we look at that text, and, and there is no PowerPoint this morning, but I'm going to call out to you what goes in your blanks on your handouts. There are still handouts in your bulletin. I'll call out what goes in the blanks as we go along. But as we look at that text this morning, um, this week and the next time I'm able to preach, we're going to consider two responses to the cross, two responses to the cross that you need to examine and consider because they will reveal to you whether or not you recognize the true value of the cross. All right, that's our aim. And this morning, we're going to focus on the first, the first of those responses. Now, Paul prefaces this section um, with two comments in verse 11 before he actually gets into the meat of the message. Um, he says in verse 11, see what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. Right? Why does he take the time to say that at the beginning? Why does he preface it with that statement? Well, he's talking about authenticating this letter, this message to the Galatians. There were some who presented things that were forgeries and tried to say that they were from the Apostle Paul. And so he's doing this to authenticate that this letter is truly from him. So he talks about, number one, in your, on your page there, the size of the letters he used. The size of the letters that he used. All right? And some say that he used large letters because Paul had bad eyesight. He had a problem with his eyes. Maybe he needed reading glasses and couldn't afford them. No. Um, some say he had an eye disease. But there doesn't seem to be a lot of strong evidence to support that. Okay? It seems, though, that, again, he's doing this for emphasis. The majority of the letter was probably written in, in a lowercase style of letter. And then this particular section near the end, he writes in all caps. Right? When you're texting someone and you want to really emphasize something, all caps, right, is a way to emphasize what you're trying to say. Same idea here, same idea. Um, he wants to emphasize the thrust of the message. Second statement here, he says, with my own hand. That goes in your second blank. With my own hand. Now, why did he say I'm writing it with my own hand? Well, it was the practice of many um, Bible teachers and so on, of the apostles, to use a secretary to write for them. They would dictate and 
the person would write down. They would call this person an amanuensis. You've got to write that down because that will be on the quiz later. An amanuensis, you've got to figure out how to spell it first, right? Um, someone who was a scribe, someone who was a secretary who would record what was written. If you were to look at Romans 16, verse 22, um, Paul is giving greetings at the end of the book of Romans, and he says, there's a statement that says, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. So that indicates that this guy, uh, Tertius, was writing the letter. He was the secretary taking down this letter for Paul, and he adds in his little greeting in that closing section of Romans. Um, it seems that this practice of Paul to write the, the closing section was, was a fairly common thing for him. Um, we see evidence of that in 1 Corinthians 16, also in Colossians chapter 4, that he wrote the greeting um, in his own hand, he says, in those two places. Also, we see a similar thing in 2 Thessalonians 3, and he gives a little bit of definition here as to, or explanation as to why he does this. So 2 Thessalonians 3.17 it says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. This is the way I write. So it's like you recognize my handwriting and so on. And he's saying, look, I'm, I'm doing this to prove that this is a genuine letter from Paul, from me. Okay? So it may also indicate, in, there, in our case here with Galatians, it may indicate that Paul wrote the entire letter himself. There's, there's a good case for that, right? You see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. He may have written the entire letter, all caps, because he was so concerned about what was going on, he didn't want anybody to miss what was happening. So that's a possibility here. But again, the idea is he wants to stress the importance of this message, and that's how he did it. So that's how he begins. <clears throat> so now let's return to look at the first of those responses to the cross that we need to examine to reveal whether we recognize its true value or not. The first response to the cross is an unwillingness to be persecuted for the cross of Christ. That's your next blank. Unwillingness to be persecuted for the cross of Christ. The word persecuted goes in there. And again, let's look at verses 12 and 13. Galatians 6. It is those who want to make good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. So as we look at that section, there's two attitudes that emerge. Okay, two attitudes that emerge um, about the idea of, of this persecution that may come. Right? The first of those attitudes is in verse 12. Um, the Judaizers took pride in their flesh. They took pride in their flesh. Right? They, they want to make a good showing in their flesh. It says that in verse 12 of Galatians 6. They want to make a good showing in the flesh. In other words, they want to emphasize what they have done in their religious system. They want to make a good physical demonstration of their faith, of their following God. And they were motivated by religious pride. They wanted everyone to see how spiritual they were. They wanted everyone to see how sincere they were. And we need to be cautious of that practice ourselves to not be so caught up in what we have accomplished in a religious sense and broadcasting that to people to make sure that they notice how spiritual we are. We need to be cautious of that. That's what the Judaizers were doing. And again, these Judaizers were of a Jewish background, but they had responded to the gospel, but they were still holding on to their, their Jewishness, their Jewish practices, and trying to, to meld or mesh those things together. And then trying to press that system on these Gentile people in Galatia, that they had to go through that entire Jewish process and Christian process, not just through the cross of Christ. So they're doing this because they are very tied to their Jewish culture. 
It was very important to them. But also, they were sensing great pressure from the Jewish community. They say, you still want to call yourself a Jew, and you still want to be connected with us, but you're talking about this Jesus on the cross stuff. And so the, so the Judaizers were trying to, to appease those people. So they were adding in this idea of circumcision, adding in this idea of having to keep the law to try to keep them happy and to try to keep a good connection with them, a good relation with them, but at the same time have the cross of Christ also. But in the process of holding on to both things, they're minimizing the cross because the cross is all that is needed. They're minimizing the cross. And they're doing this because they fear those of their Jewish culture. They don't want to be ostracized. They don't want to be um, pushed aside from them. So they had been circumcised. Um, That's your next blank there. These Judaizers, they had been circumcised. Okay, they had gone through that process. And uh, it wasn't that they were rejecting, again, Christ on the cross, uh, but they were preserving this circumcision and this keeping of the law as requirements for their faith. See, the Judaizers tried to make a good show of their zeal, a good outward show, so they'd still be accepted by these non-believing Jews. So do we ever face things like that, where there's pressure on us to hold on to things that maybe aren't really part of what Christianity is? Uh, We may be, you know, we may accept the traditions, I'm sorry, we may accept additions to the faith of Christ because of pressure from our culture, different backgrounds. I've been reading a, a book, and I have some of the guys who are reading it as well, and it's called The Chinese Way of Doing Things. And it's, and it's written by a ABC you know, Christian, and he is interviewing other people and students and so on and recording their responses to their Chinese culture and the Christian faith and how those things fit together or don't fit together and so on, their reactions. And so in that book, one student that's interviewed in that book talks about the idea that Chinese church leaders, he felt, were using Christianity to promote Chinese values, right? They weren't using Christianity to teach Christianity. He felt that in some sense they were using Christianity to teach and enforce Chinese values, okay? Sounds a little similar, right, to our Galatian situation with these Judaizers. Um, One of my daughters who told told me when she was in the children's Sunday school program, she said that one of her teachers told her that when Jesus was a child and he was a a young boy and he was with his parents in Jerusalem, right, Mary and Joseph, and they were traveling back to their home that Jesus stayed behind. And they noticed he was missing, and they went looking for him, trying to find him. And when they found him, he was in the temple with the teachers and the scholars, and he said to them, do you not know that I must be in my father's house? See, he was on the verge of becoming a young man at that point. He was, it was his bar mitzvah time in, in, the, in that range. And so he was taking the next step in that practice. And the teacher told one of my daughters that, see, because the parents were concerned, they didn't know where he was, and so the statement that was made, which is still shocking to me, was that, well, Jesus sinned by disobeying his parents. Now, at first, that might not sound like a real big deal initially, but when you think about the fact that Jesus died on the cross for all who would believe, and the only reason he could die for all who would believe was because he was what? Sinless. Thank you. I'm glad to hear your your response. Because he was sinless. So if Jesus had sinned when he was even a child, a boy, a young boy, that would invalidate his ability to be the Lamb of God, to die on the cross for the sins of all who would believe. Now, I don't know who taught that. My, My daughter doesn't remember who said that, but she remembers that. And she had told us about it several years later. And then she said, but after I heard that, I thought to myself, 
that's not right. And I said, yes. <laughs> um, but that was something that was taught. And again, trying to, and it's not that the Bible doesn't say that children should obey their parents. It says that, just not in that passage, and just not with that at stake, right? That, that issue of Christ's sinlessness at stake. Um, another circumstance that I, that I heard myself was someone taught that when Jesus turned water into wine at the wedding, remember that? In the Gospel of John, chapter 2, said that he did this because he was obeying his mother. Do you remember the passage in John 2, right? In verse 3, he says they were at the wedding and they ran out of wine. And the mother said to Jesus, you know, they have no wine. And Jesus says, well, what do you want me to do about it, woman? Right? Well, that's not my concern. Like, Ma, don't bug me, right? Um, and it says, so the, so the implication from the, from the teacher was that Jesus made the water into wine because he was obeying his mother. Is that why Jesus made water into wine? Well, let's look at verse 11 of John 2. It says, this is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. He made the water into wine, not because his mother nagged him to, but because it was a manifestation of his glory and it brought his disciples to believe. And if we look at the Gospel of John as a whole, that entire book, chapter 20, verse 30, 31, gives us the purpose, right? It says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, verse 31. But these are written, these signs that he did, and the water into wine was the first, they were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's why Jesus turned water into wine. That's why Jesus turned water into wine. So we need to be careful. And, and, and I'm, I'm not saying, you know, that I've never made a mistake and never said anything wrong, but I pray that someone will point it out to me if I have. Um, or when I do, not, not if, but when I do. Because <laughs> I know I'll say things wrong. But we need to be cautious about these things that come from our background and our thinking and our preconceived ideas and trying to press those on top of Scripture when that's not what Scripture really intends. Because when we do that, we end up doing damage to the Scriptures. We do damage to basic truths of Christianity. We need to be cautious about that. And we begin in a, in a way, depending on what it is we're talking about, we in some ways can minimize the cross of Christ, and, and elevate other things that we want to try to promote for our own benefit, okay? So we need to be very careful about that. Another statement from that same book, The Chinese Way of Doing Things, um, one, of the, one of the other students interviewed said uh, that he had learned to play the Chinese church game in order to get along in the church. He had learned how it worked and the things that were being done and the expectations that were there that weren't necessarily biblical expectations. And he said he had kind of learned to fit in to be accepted. The Judaizers were playing the Jewish game to be, still be accepted, to keep one foot in the Jewish world and still keep a foot in the, the Christian world and trying to, to please both sides. And there are, there are times when we have to cut ties in certain ways, with other things. And these Judaizers needed to cut ties with the idea of pressing circumcision in obedience to the law. But they weren't willing to do that because they feared that they would be persecuted by the Jews if they did. Do we ever feel that kind of pressure? That if we cut ties in certain ways, that we might feel pressure? We need to, we need to examine that closely and decide how to respond to that. A second statement here, uh, another blank to fill in, they would force Gentiles to be circumcised. They would force Gentiles to be circumcised, right? They want to compel you 
They want to pressure you into going through this practice that they've been through because they felt that by getting these Gentiles, these non-Jewish Christians to go through that same practice um, that the Jews endorsed, that that might somehow reduce the pressure that the Judaizers were feeling from the Jewish culture, right? And make them a little more acceptable. See, see, we've gotten these Gentiles to come over to our way, at least partially. And they were doing this to reduce the persecution that they would experience if that hadn't happened. At least that's what they thought they could do, accomplish through that process. Right, Acts 15, verse 1. So some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Right? That's what was being promoted. That's an idea that existed. And so these Judaizers were trying to satisfy that expectation and at the same time hang on to the cross. But in the process, again, they end up minimizing the cross itself. They claimed it was necessary for Gentiles to be circumcised. Um, and again, it was to protect themselves, really. They weren't really so concerned about those Gentile Galatians. They were more concerned about themselves. We need to be watchful what our motivations are when we push certain ideas, certain principles. Am I pressing this because it benefits me, or am I truly serving my brothers and sisters in Christ based on what Scripture teaches? So the Judaizers desired to avoid being persecuted. That's your next blank there. They desired to avoid being persecuted. They feared the reaction that they would get from the Jews. Um, to the Jews, the cross was an object of shame, right? How could the Messiah be put on a cross? That's preposterous. How could you even suggest something like that? But the Judaizers were, were men-pleasers. They wanted everybody to like them. They wanted the Christians to like them, and they wanted the Jews to like them, so they tried to ride the fence in the middle. You know what happens when you, when you try to stay in the middle? You get squashed, right? Remember the karate kid? Remember the karate kid, Mr. Miyagi? Walk the left side's okay, walk the right side's okay, walk in the middle, you get squashed like a grape. That was his illustration. Um, anyhow, not a biblical illustration, so don't go, don't go looking for that in the Old Testament somewhere. It's not there. But the Judaizers were hoping to escape the wrath of unbelieving Jews um, because they had espoused the cross of Christ. See, the Jews were looking down on them. How are you taking up this cross of Christ? How are you saying that you are following Jesus now who died on the cross? You're a Jew. But they thought, again, if I can get some Gentiles to follow circumcision, then that will take some of the pressure off of me. See, I'm really proselytizing them to bring them into the Jewish, more of the Jewish system. And they thought they could reduce the pressure. We need to be careful that we don't have our own methods that we're trying to promote. See, they're more concerned, again, about their personal safety than they were about correct doctrine. And doctrine is essential, because if we aren't believing the right things, we're not going to live the right way. But when we try to minimize doctrine, that's when we begin to have trouble. See, doctrine draws a line. Doctrine says this is true and this is not. And you can't straddle the line trying to entertain what's true and not true at the same time. It's, it's disastrous. So they knew the offense of the cross would be softened, again, if they proclaimed justification by faith plus works, right? Just a small little tweak at the end, just plus works. Justification by faith, we agree with that. We, we promote that, but it's also works added. But again, that is what? Is that the gospel? That's a different gospel, isn't it? That's a different gospel. What did the Apostle Paul already tell us in the book of Galatians about a different gospel? Has he said anything about that? Does he have any concerns about that? Is there any statement about that? Is it just a, a casual warning? Or is it a strong statement? Listen to what he says. Let's remind ourselves. Back in chapter 1, verse 8 of Galatians, Paul says, But even if we, he and his other fellow apostles, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel 
contrary to the one that we preached to you, slap him on the wrist and remind him to straighten up. Is that what it says? No. He says, if they should preach a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. Let him be damned. Let him be punished and cursed for that error. And then he goes on in verse 9. And as we've said before, so I now say it again, in case you weren't paying attention the first time, right? If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. May judgment come on his head. That's what he's saying. This is serious business to get this message right. You can't tweak it to what makes you happy. You can't tweak it to what you think will make the people around you happy, to make it more acceptable to them. Jesus died on the cross because you are sinners, because I am a sinner, and there's no other way that we can be forgiven of those sins and restored to God unless someone dies to take that punishment. And Christ did that for us. And he could do it because he was absolutely, and still is, absolutely sinless. The perfect sacrifice that only had to be made one time for all eternity. And it's not Jesus plus anything else. It's not grace through faith plus anything. It's only by grace through faith in Christ. It's grace alone in Christ alone by faith alone period. And any time we tamper with that, and usually we tamper with it to, to make ourselves more comfortable or to make the people around us more comfortable or the people that we're trying to witness to more comfortable because we think we have to be a good salesman and only tell them the positive points, not the negative points. Any time we tamper with the message, that curse from Galatians 1 applies to us. This is serious business, folks. This is not a game. This is not a casual thing. This is following the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross because you are a sinner. Because we are all sinners who need to be forgiven. And that is the only means by which that will ever happen. We can't lose sight of that. We can't lose sight of that. The Judaizers took pride in keeping the law. But he says that they, they did not keep the law. Right? That's your next two statements there. Judaizers took pride in keeping the law, but they didn't even keep the law. Paul says back in chapter 2, he says, How is it that you expect these Gentiles to live like Jews when you don't even live like Jews? They were totally banking on their circumcision, and they were ignoring um, other parts of the law. They figured if I just keep the circumcision portion or a couple select little laws, that God will give me credit for everything. See, they weren't even doing it sincerely themselves, and they're trying to force others into that same path. So they, they desired to have the Gentiles circumcised so that they could boast in the Gentiles. See, we've, we've proselytized these Gentiles. They've come to be circumcised. They've come to follow the law. See, we've, and, and in the same time, we've reduced the pressure on ourselves. That's the idea. So now they could boast in the Gentiles. Look what we did. We got Gentiles to come. We got them to be circumcised. Look what we did. Are you happy with us now? That was their motive. That was their motive. But it was just another means of avoiding persecution because the cross to them was not worth being persecuted for. Let me say that again. The cross to them was not worth being persecuted for. What about us? Do we see the cross of Christ as something worth being persecuted for? Do we? And if we don't, what does that say about our faith? If we don't think the cross is worth being persecuted for, facing ostracism, facing ridicule, facing rejection, 
<laughs> facing physical punishment. Do you know how many people suffered and died to put this book in a language that we could read and give it to the common people? Many people gave their lives to do that for the scriptures. How much do you value the cross of Christ? Or are you more concerned about being accepted by everyone? Is that more important to you? If that's more important to you, then you've just admitted that the cross has lessened in its value to you. The cross needs to be supreme. What does the Apostle Paul say in the next section? Stark contrast, verse 14 of Galatians 6. But far be it from me, Paul says, to boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I won't boast in other Gentiles. I won't boast in circumcision. I won't boast in the law. I will only boast in the cross of Christ, period. And that's the point we'll get into next time. Do you boast in the cross of Christ? Or are there competing things that you boast in? Primarily your own comfort and security. What do you boast in? I hope it's the cross of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cross of Christ. We thank you for its immeasurable value to us. But we confess to you, Lord, that we often lose sight of its value. We often become more concerned about our own comfort, our own security, our own ease in life, our own acceptance by others. Lord, please forgive us for that. Help us to recognize the true value of the cross. Help us to place all of our hope and all of our trust in the cross of Christ. Help us to lift it up as the supreme thing. And it's not the cross itself, but it's what Christ did on that cross that is so valuable. One who was sinless became sin for us that we might have the righteousness of God. What an incredible blessing. What an incredible value. Lord, help us to grow in our knowledge and understanding of that great truth that we may value the cross of Christ above all other things and that we may be willing to spend and be spent for the cross of Christ. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.